the topic that we're looking at today is how has coronavirus affected how we serve and how do we involve passengers in a safe and caring way. Um, I really want to thank you for coming and, and just kind of set a bit of a, of a sense of kind of what we're talking about today. You know, I think we all know that CT often represents the brightest and the best of inclusion and accessibility. And I was sent about a week ago a survey that Disability Equality Scotland had done on people returning to public transport. And that found that about 50% of people that they surveyed who have accessibility needs had made the decision to not return so far to public transport. Concerns, unsurprisingly, were around last minute changes to timetables, to routes, capacity on the vehicle, a lack of additional support and face coverings. And, and it was a pretty depressing read, but there was a real glimmer in the survey to CT, conversely was described as a godsend. That's a direct quote. Drivers are really helpful and friendly. Dial a ride in my area have added services when public transport just wasn't available. So I think we all know that CT is already doing so many good things for accessibility and inclusion, but there are a lot of new pressures in the pandemic that we currently face. Um, and I think, you know, questions around what's an essential journey, who makes that decision, how much agency do people have when there's such a need to protect the community? With tightening budgets, are we still able to offer such a tailored service? And in the midst of all of these new things, these new voices, how can we still hear and include the voices of our service users? So we've got three really helpful perspectives today, utterly different, coming at this from a really different angle, that I think we'll be really excited to hear from. So we'll be hearing from Richard Jones, who's Chair of Accessible Care and Transport, and himself has used the service. We'll be hearing from Eddie Lynch, who's Commissioner for Older People for Northern Ireland. And then lastly, we'll be hearing from Bruce Cruikshank, who's a My, Guides, My Sighted Guide Trainer with Guide Dogs in Scotland. I would really, if you have questions, please do stick them in the chat. You know, I think we really want to get a dialogue going about what we can do, what we can always do better. And this is a real opportunity to to ask those questions and swap those ideas. So I would really encourage you to do that. I'm going to hand over to Richard now. Again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you for coming. Um, and, and let's get going. Richard, can you give us your perspective? Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, so as Rachel said, my name is Richard, um, and I'm the chairperson of Accessible Care and Transport. Uh, we're a uh, community transport based in South Wales. Um, I took over as chair I say took over, it sounds a bit of a sort of a takeover bid. Um, I became chair in January. Um, we've been going 31 years uh, this year. We have seven drivers, four passenger assistants, three staff members. And we've always been user, a user-led user, user -led organization. Our board is made up, has primarily been made up of uh, members and those members could have been representatives of organizations that have been members or individual uh, individuals um for me personally just to give you a little bit of a, a pocket history into my time in the organization um act has been a, a mainstay of, of my life in many respects because um it took me to primary school to comprehensive school and then obviously in latter years when i opened my company up to, to work um, and it's always been there um, and it's been there for other key key events. I was a trustee on the board um, 12 or 14 years ago um, for a period I was chair then as well and I've recently come back because the charity was going through some difficulties and I've, I felt I needed to give back. Um, we, we struggled with recruiting members now um, and I think a lot of that has been because of the structure change in the way we've operated. We operate um, and please forgive me for my, my lack of, of technical knowledge. I'm not a, I don't even drive so I, I'm sorry if I'm using the wrong permits or the wrong terminology but we, we operate a, a dial the right scheme which many of our members use the concessionary phase 
paths that the, the, the paths to use. Um, so they don't really get anything from being a member of the organization as such. So we, we've lost that engagement with our membership. And I think that's something that as, as chair, I, I think I need to rebuild. It's difficult at the moment because obviously we've got um, a, pan, a global pandemic in case nobody has noticed. Um, and it's, it's engaging with a lot of our, com our community and our members are elderly. And I'm not from one minute being ages because my mother jumps over my head technology wise but they haven't got the technology to engage with us in Zoom meetings and other, other ways. Um, so that's where we are as a, as a child, and we're finding that difficult. Um, as I said, I joined the board in uh, January to take the organization out to a difficult period. The board is made up of myself and three of my friends. They're not, they are members now because they have to be to be on the board, but um, they're not they're not members, they're not people with disabilities, they're my friends who come on board to help me turn the organization around. Um, and that's I think a shame because if we'd have had that membership, that, that strong connection with our membership, we would have had people come in and help take ownership of the organization. Don't get me wrong, my 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 three other trustees are fantastic. Um, and they would kick me for saying otherwise. Um, but they don't have the strong, strong love for the organization, I suppose, that I have. So I think building the, 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 those links are vital. I mean, Gemma came to our, our AGM and I mean, it was, it was very well attended because people wanted to know the difficulties we'd gone through. You know, they, they were, they were some, some sort of, issues that had gone on last tail end of last year and and the jungle drums had been beaten and people wanted to know the gossip more than anything um so that's why it was that well attended but you know my aim is to improve the the service user engagement with the charity because we we're, we're well respected locally um we we're busy um the local authority uh use us and we We've got a good, um, you know, we've got a good footfall for one of their expression, but it's it's just getting people to engage as members and turning those members into active um, volunteers and 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 trustees to take ownership of the charity because that's how it will, in my opinion, it will progress, um, and and hopefully then they can take over from me and I can have a lie down in a dark room. Um, I think really that is where we are. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit of a, an insight. Um, and if, I, like I said, if anybody has any questions at the end, please feel free to get in touch. That's really helpful. Thank you, Richard. It, it's really great to kind of get a sense of where you are. Um, and we've had a message through from, from Thurston that says, all publicity is good publicity. So there you go. Maybe, maybe there are some positives in there as well. Thank you so much. And I'm sure people will have questions um, once we hit that part of the session. Eddie, what do you think is your perspective? Obviously, you work with, with older people and, and they do represent a real key group for our members. What's your perspective with the pandemic at the moment? Um, thank, thank you, Rachel. And, uh, Good, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the invitation to be part um, of today's event. Um, um, for me, this is a great opportunity to actually hear from the sector, the CT sector, and I think it is, it's very timely for me, given the, you know, the huge challenges that we're facing um, as a society at the minute, but also particularly for older people um, who are facing un, you know, unprecedented challenges in, in every aspect of their lives. Um, I have, you know, a great deal of time for community transport. I've been very much aware for many years about the role that um, it plays in providing those services and the, the sort of social purpose um, and community benefit that it brings to so many people right across the UK. Um, I mean, I have been working with older people and older people's groups for 12 years now in this role and a previous role as the head of a charity in Northern Ireland. 
Um, and prior to that, I also worked in transport policy for the Consumer Council here. So and that I worked very closely with the community transport sector here as well. So I know very much the value it has um, to its members. And obviously, Richard, you know, outlined that much better than I could and um, just how important it has played throughout his lifetime. And I think it also, we have an aging population and, you know, one of the big parts of having a successful aging population, if you like, is to keep people active and keeping people socially connected. Um, and that's a key part of active aging and, and aging healthy. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's lots of research out there now that shows you, yes, things like exercise and diet and, and your genes and all of that are, are important issues and in, in living longer, healthier. But it's the social connections and being um, retained as part of society and having those connections is also a key part of sustaining people later in life. So um, for me, I, you know, I have been involved a number of times in my role as commissioner in Northern Ireland to sort of highlight the importance of community transport. Um, you know, would get, get, I would get involved if there's any consultations and on any new regulations or issues. Um, and try to advocate uh, for the sector because I know about the quality uh, it brings to many older people and people with disabilities and their lives and, and the difference that makes. And it actually, you know, it really is a lifeline for so many people. So that's where I'm coming from. And I think um, it sort of brings it on up to, up to, to today. And, you know, I think the sector, certainly in Northern Ireland, I'm sure it's the case elsewhere, that there, there have been difficult times, there have been budget cuts, there have been pressures and services. There have been changes made uh, to regulations that have made it difficult um, in terms of recruit, recruiting volunteer drivers. Um, and I think the danger at the minute with the pandemic consuming us and all the huge challenges we face, it's very important that we don't let government um, have this distraction of a pandemic to you know, you know, know, reduce um, other services like uh, community transport and allow them to whether away or abandon its users, we have to make sure that we have to keep recognizing the good things that are out there, the things that work well, um, and the things that make a difference and support them. So um, certainly in my role, I, at a, sort of at a policy level, my, my role is really to promote and safeguard the interests of older people in Northern Ireland. That's what my legislation says. I am there to, to champion the, the needs of older people and I suppose give a voice uh, to the issues that are important to them. And I suppose for many who avail of community transport, they maybe don't have that strong a voice to, to do that. So it's important for myself and other organizations that we use every opportunity to do this. I think where we are at the minute is, is a very concerning time. Obviously we're, on, we're in the mouth of the second wave of the pandemic. And I think older people who I'm speaking to are, you know, they find it difficult as we all have um, over the last seven months. But I think where we are now, there are real fears about the sort of medium to longer term impact of this. I think the pennies dropping with a lot of people that, you know, we're not going to have a vaccine by Christmas. You know, we're talking about at least another year, maybe 18 months of this. So as a society, what we need to be doing is looking at that and, and realizing there are people in our society who are very vulnerable to this coronavirus who will have to go back into shielding. And the question then is, how do we support those people? And I think that's one of the questions, I suppose, for the community transport um, sector, those people who no longer feel safe to go out shopping or, or you know, in, into different places who would maybe use the services. You know, how, do, how does the sector adapt to that, but still provide that support? You know, and maybe it's about bringing services to those people as opposed to the other way. Um, so there are the challenges that I see, um, you know, facing all of us. But, you know, um, to me, community transport has always been a very flexible, innovative, um, person-centered model of transport. And I think because of that, it's, it's in a really good position to adapt to these, these, these times that we, we find. And I think with the right support um, and sort of out-of-the-box thinking, they, that community transport can play a key role in providing that support that older people need uh, in the coming months um, ahead. And 
to do that, I mean, the, the solution is very simple. I, I'm always a great believer in talking to people and talking to people who use services. Um, to me, it's always about um, my last job in the head of a, a, a older people's charity. It was about supporting older people to have their say, and our strap line was speaking from experience. And that's to me, that's the key. You know, it's about designing things, listening to service users, and saying, "What is it you need? What where are the areas you're struggling? What would make the most benefit to you in your life?" And it's very hard to beat that. And I think, you know, when people sometimes are asking me in my role, "What do older people need right now?" Yes, of course, they need food and drink and shelter and we need to protect them but they need more than that they need a quality of life so it, it is about you know human contact it's about a friendly face it's about conversation and um, those are the things that bring quality to life and I think you know there is a danger unless we focus on this you know we can't we can't have a situation where we just shut older people away for the next six months and saying look you just have to shield you know, lock yourselves down and get out the other side because we know there's lots of evidence that um, the loneliness and isolation of that is actually having detrimental impacts on physical, mental and emotional well-being. So to me, community transport is in a really important position to try to keep people connected um, to their communities, try where possible to keep them active. Um, and try to stay healthier and, and enjoy life basically you know it's, it's about just um, you know even recognizing these are very difficult times for us all um, but we do need to reach out to support those who are more isolated who may not have anybody who may really rely on, on those connections um, and I think it's, it's not easy this none of this is easy um, but I do think we all have to just think about how we do things going forward now and you know the challenge is set that i think we're, we're we're heading into a difficult winter um and i think providers like yourselves have a key role in in working with the government working with authorities and working with the people who need your services to see how we get through the next year as best we can so i mean that's my my take on things at the minute i say i'm really delighted to be part of this today and i'm really keen um to hear any the other contributors and any I'll take any questions so thank you thank you so much Eddie I think that's really so helpful and keeping a kind of half eye on the chat I think lots of people are really kind of really understanding a lot of the things you're, you're talking around around those issues of balancing agency and, and the mental health benefits of so many of these things that may or may not be essential journey you know this is such a changing issue isn't it and it's really really helpful to get your perspective and there are definitely questions I think once we've heard from Bruce that will shoot across to you because we'll be really keen to get your input so thank you last but very much not least we've got Bruce Bruce can you please give us your your guide dog's perspective we're so excited to hear how you work <laughs> There's no pressure then. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. I, my name is Bruce Krugshunk. I am a service user, first and foremost, of guide dogs, um, as well as a my guide volunteer and trainer. Um, I've been involved with guide dogs since 2012, um, since losing my sight in 2010 um, due to mismanagement of my type 1 diabetes. Um, so <clears throat> I've been involved with guide dogs eight years now. Um, so it's great to be part of the, the, the bigger picture at Guide Dogs. Um, Guide Dogs is a very person-centred charity in relation to the, the lookout for the well-being and um, the, it's not just the dog to look out for, the lookout for the human as well. Um, so that's a, a great part thing to be part of. Um, and they've also got various campaigns and they go about the mobility and the, the access issues to transport and such like. Um, so for me personally, um, community transport is not something you see very much of in our area. Um, so it's all public transport, trains and things. So I find myself using the public transport, I must admit, um, hold my hands up. Um, admittedly, I haven't been on one um, since the coronavirus kind of kicked in, has left, however it's up to at the moment. Um, but it's always in the back of your mind what's what's going to happen. Um, but Guide Dogs, for me, um, is a great organisation. 
because of the freedom, independence and mobility that you get from having the dog. Um, but in saying that, I must say happy White Cane Day to everybody because this is National White Cane Day. Um, so it's like a big celebration going on within the, the visual impaired community at the moment. Um, Guide Dogs, as I said, is a very person-centred organisation. They support um, the two million people with visual impairments and registered blind in the, the UK. That's covering Northern Ireland as well. Um, they also have over 1,400 volunteers across the organisation, um, which I am proud to be one of those. Um, and it's good that we've got somebody like Georgia kind of leading the way and telling us all what to do and where to go. Um, but then when she lands you doing something like this, you, you do wonder. Um, <laughs> so, but no, it's great to be part of it. Um, the bigger picture for us, I suppose, is how we go forward and how we support our service users. Um, we are in a very strong position at the moment because we are looking to lift some new services um, in regards to telephone calls with service users um, to see how their well-being, mental health is in regards to themselves as well as their dogs. Because as you can understand, for a visual impaired person going into the local Tesco's or any sort of shop where you're socially distanced to two metres and all these types of things, is very, very challenging. Um, the other thing that's very challenging in respect to getting some sort of shopping is if you go to the local Tesco, for instance, and you require an assisted shop, that makes it even more challenging because you've got somebody two metres away from you that you're possibly relying on to guide you around the shop and um, have a chat to, because that could be the only person you come in contact with that day. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of challenges going on. Um, the guide dog being the person-centred organisation that they are, are putting things in place or have put things in place, sorry, for the service user um, and for the volunteers as well. Um, we get regular contact from, from the team, regular updates and emails and things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good. And the, the technology, because of technology that we've got nowadays, um, Zoom seems to be the easiest one, but because of the technology that we've got nowadays, we can keep in contact with people far easier than what we would have done if this had happened 15, 20 years ago when we didn't have such great technology. Um, so things are moving forward quite fast, um, but we just hope that when we come out the other side of this COVID situation, that we are in a stronger position to go forward should we ever land back in this again. Um, it's great to be part of today's gathering um, because it's obviously it's, it's, it's the promotion of guide dogs, but it also gives us an opportunity to meet other organisations that trying to strive to do the same as what we're doing. Um, and it's always better going forward stronger in numbers. Um, and as Eddie said, it's how we how we support the the older generations, the shielding people and things along that lines going forward. So yep, yeah, great to be part of it and we'd like to thank you for inviting us to it. Thank you so much, Bruce. That's really helpful. I I wanted to ask you, now as part of my sighted guide, that and, and correct me if I if I'm wrong, is people supporting people with sight loss when for whatever reason there might not be a dog. Is that right? Um, the the my guide service can be with or without a dog. Okay. Okay. Um, because you could be uh, an individual with a guide dog living alone, um, but they you have to free run your dog at least twenty minutes per day, three times a week, or okay. uh, twenty minutes a day or three times a week. Well, you might not have the confidence to find the the park, or your dog might not do what it's told, so you need a, a bit of a hand to go and do that. You might not have some family support around you because they may all work full time. Um, so you've got the, the option of a, a My Guide volunteer. Um, can I ask, with the volunteers, are there, any, are there any sort of key lessons that they learn that would also be useful for our members when they're supporting people with sight loss? <laughs> so... It, it, the most important things that uh, is taught is how to approach, um, how to guide, 
um, and to the best thing you can do is ask to see how much assistance that individual needs. Because if you pulled up at my front door and I was getting onto the bus, I'm quite happy to manage myself with the dog. Um, but you could have somebody in their seventies, possibly with a, another mobility issue that needs a bit of assistance. So it's all about that person at that time. Um, there is, there is useful videos on YouTube and things that you can watch to see about the, the guiding technique and things. I'm sure George will share the, the links on the, the chat with you as all well, that you can use to follow to see how to guide somebody safely. That's so helpful, Bruce. Thank you. I'm realising, Georgia, that I have really unhelpfully not told people who you are. Georgia is here also from Guide Dogs um, and, and manages the sighted guide training. So if there are any technical questions or just questions about training, um, she is our absolute go-to. Um, and, and I see she's in the chat already. So if you do have questions about supporting people with sight loss, then please do direct those to her rather than us because she will have far better answers. Um, Gemma, firstly, let me say thank you so much to all our speakers. I think those are three really, really interesting perspectives um, and, and ones that kind of get the mind ticking over about what we could do differently, better, you know, and, and how we can best serve passengers. Gemma, are there any kind of pertinent themes or questions coming up in the chat that you want to post to the to the speakers yeah we've had quite a, an interesting discussion and thanks so much to all the members who are just getting involved in and actually giving some answers to people this is something that we see quite a lot in our advice drop-in sessions that we host on a friday um, there's a huge wealth of knowledge and expertise in the cta membership so thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and your your experiences with each other there um, i've just pulled out some of the questions um, and discussion points. Um, so Maggie um, posed a question quite early on in the chat um, talking about passengers with restricted mobility. So because of the, the strict hygiene routines and um, making sure that people are maintaining as, as much social distance as possible, some people find it quite difficult to get in and out of the back seat, which is where they're advised to sit to maintain the most um, safe distance. So how, how are um, participants um, supporting passengers to, to manage this, to, to make your service more accessible in those kinds of situations? I don't know whether Richard might be a good person to come in on that in, in terms of how your, your staff and your volunteers are supporting passengers at the moment. Sorry. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's the same as with, with clamping wheelchairs. Clamping wheelchairs is another one where, you know, speaking of my own personal circumstances, you can't really socially distance when you, when you put your head under somebody's wheelchair. Um, so I, I suppose it, it's... You know, our buses, as, as, as you know, they, they laid out to this, this seats that people can and can't sit in. It's just about allocating the right seat to the right passenger. And I mean, we, as, as, a, as an office team, we know generally, we, we don't have, um, you know, people who haven't booked before generally. And if we do, we, we have a chat with them, we find out what they, what they I, I don't want to use the word capabilities are, that's the wrong it's the wrong way, but we find out their limitations and, and how much support they need, and then we direct them to the seat that's, that's most appropriate for them, really. Um, and obviously, you know, if somebody isn't able to get into the back, we have got the lift, so we could lower the lift down so they could come up on the lift to get into the back seat, um, which would probably be easier for them. But um, it's just about finding people's, what, what, what works for, for the individual. I can see that George has popped a response in the chat talking about asking the passenger about their preferences. Georgia, do you want to touch on that in a bit more detail? Yes, I was just going to say, like Bruce said, uh, somebody echoed what he was saying about uh, oftentimes people have concerns about saying the wrong thing or offending someone, particularly with someone with a visual impairment, because you don't have um, those kind of visual cues to show the intent behind your question. But really, our approach to that and our advice is always that it's best to ask and hear from the expert themselves on how they would like to be supported and indeed some people in the in the chat have 
spoken about how some people would prefer, of course, at the moment, not to have that close contact. So it's about having that conversation to negotiate that with the person. Yeah, absolutely. So true. Thank you. Um, following on from that, um, and I, we had a, an additional question to um, coming from Richard's piece, um, talking about clients that are registering um, to use with the um, use the service. This is a question or comment really from Pat Kynaston. Um, talking about being reliant on the board. So this is something that Richard I know mentioned. Um, does anyone have any input? I don't know whether our um, panelists are um, the, the best to come in on this, but just in terms of where you're trying to deliver a, a service that meets the needs of your passengers, how can we support board members who are often working full time or working part time or have caring responsibilities? How can we support those board members to make sure that they're delivering services in an accessible way? Can I can I jump in? It's yeah. it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, and and Gemma, you know, I'm speaking to you, I suppose, in a way because you know this better than anybody. Um, becoming chair of ACT in in um, January, it's been relentless. It's 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 been, I mean, it's, it's been a pandemic on its own um, because it's been so demanding, um, and it is it's it's difficult um, because. I, as I said, at the start of my, my piece, I don't drive. Um, I was out of touch, because obviously I'd, I'd been a, a number of years away from the organization. So I wasn't familiar with uh, permits and, and licenses. You know, Jen has given us some great training, which has been well received, even though I turned up late to one event, vir virtually late, it turns up virtually late. Um, but I, um, <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it's right. And I think we, we, we try and engage with our members, we, we regularly contact the members, even when the service was sort of uh, running as a skeleton, we, we wanted to make sure they had a friendly face, a, you know, a, a friendly voice to, to speak to, and that they knew that we were, while we may not be able to offer them everything that we would normally offer them, that we were still there. But as a board, we, ha we, we haven't got that support other than, in all fairness, through, through the CTA and, and through Gemma, who's, who's been, Fantastic! It's, we, you know, becoming a trustee for me, and I'm a trustee for a few organisations, is a full-time job in itself. And I think people, I find it hard to 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 balance that. You know, when you when you're recruiting new trustees and you're looking at to, taking the organisation forward, people don't want to get involved. They they either want to get involved and they realise how much work it is and go, or they know how much work it is and don't want to get involved. And that's the worry for me is 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 we're scaring people, and it's it's not just CTA or, or community uh, or transport in general. It's across the boundary sector. We're scaring people off by the the work, the demands that we put on our our trustees. Um, so I know that hasn't answered the question strictly, but it, it is my thoughts on it. And I just put in a wee plug at this point for the big ideas, big question session we're holding later. Um, sometime between now and Christmas about volunteers. I think Richard, you'd be a shoe in for the audience of that one um, because I think we'll be hitting a lot of these themes again. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to ask you all a question really about choice. You know, there is obviously currently a real need to balance personal desire of where people might want to go um, with safety for the organization for the driver for the for the passenger assistant do you, any of you have any experience or any opinion on how you have those conversations where you're looking to balance all of those different things because you know it, it's a really sensitive conversation to have particularly i think where people maybe have less mobility than they had last time they were on the service six months six months ago so do any of you have any perspective i'm thinking eddie we spoke about this on monday you know about how you make that balance yes i, I mean i, I think <clears throat> this is one of the the big issues now for older people in general um that um at the start it was very much the message was 
stay at home, lockdown, shield. And by and large, a lot of people could do that for a period of time. It wasn't easy, but people thought I can do that for two or three months. I think as we now enter in a longer term, people have to have the right information about the risks that are out there. But we also have to balance that with the views of people. Um, older people, like any group, have a range of different opinions and views, and um, some will be more risk averse than others. Um, some will, will make want to make decisions about their lives and saying, well, I, I can't cope with just full lockdown for another year, so I'm going to be sensible, but I'm go I want to still be active in some respects. And I think um, for yourselves and dealing with your users, you'll probably get a mix of people with that as well, that, that idea. So I think that's the challenge. I think we have to we have to treat people as adults. We have to sort of be as careful as possible, but I think we do need to recognize all parts of health. Um, it, you know, it's not just physically protecting people from the virus. Um, and I think that's what's coming out more clearly now is that the mental and emotional and physical well-being of people are affected by being shut away. You know, we're hearing a lot of stories about people whose mobility, as you say, has reduced since lockdown because they just physically haven't been out and about and um so i think we're learning you know i think the the the, the health service is learning about the impact of this I, I still think there's a lot more to come out of it i'm sure there's going to be huge mental health issues come out of it um but i i do think it's a, it's about again responding listening um and trying to come up with solutions that meet the needs of people but at the same time as providers you obviously have a duty of care to your drivers your volunteers as well and it's just it's i think it's really working together we have a i'm not sure if it's as a common across the uk but we have a term called co-production in northern ireland that is trotted out at every instance and quite frankly there's there's not often good examples of it actually in place but i do think if ever we need co-production, it's now. It's about really working together and listening to people about what they need, and really as, as much as we possibly can, try to try to shape and design our services around that. And I think it, it's it's up to authorities and funders as well to be flexible with providers. You know that it's not just here's the service you must provide. We're in we're in different times now, and we have to we have to be flexible. And I think that there's a duty on funders and authorities to recognize that and say to people, look, you're the experts, you're the guys at the front line, you're the guys who deal with people and, and support people. You know, you work out what works best for you. Yes, take your precautions. Yes, put them in place. But let's try to get a bit of a balance. That's a really helpful insight. Thank you. Um, I, I can see that Leslie Ann has got her hand raised. Leslie, do you want to, Leslie Ann, do you want to come in at this Thank point? You. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Yes, hiya. yes just very, I'm Leslie Ann from Southampton Community Transport. Um, just following up on what Eddie was saying there. The first thing we did when we um, said we were going to start our transport back on the 1st of July, obviously we did our risk assessments, but we had all our volunteers in, um, socially distant. Some just said immediately that they didn't want to drive, and the ones who did want further information come in. We just made sure, as we did with our paid drivers as well, that everyone was happy with what we were asking them to do, because obviously there's a lot of people who require an arm, um, some sort of assistance. They all have their PPE, they all have their gloves, their shields, um, their spray, but we wanted to make sure everyone was comfortable because through this experience, as, again, as, as Eddie has said, um, what we're finding from people is there are some people who are still afraid to go out. They still enjoy that weekly phone call, a bit of crack, a bit of chat. There are also people who have said, we really want to get out here. You know, it's going to cause me more harm being at home mm -hmm. than not going out. So we had to just make sure that some of our volunteers said, no, we're not ready yet. But they wanted to volunteer. So they actually we placed them with another organization. So they're doing good morning calls on behalf of, on behalf of that organization. But the ones who wanted to. They knew that I would say 60% of our passengers needed some assistance, but we sort of were deeming 
the length of time it takes you to walk them from their house to the car or the bus it could be five minutes it's not a long period of time you know so we were deeming that the risks of that with everyone wearing PPE our passengers wearing masks were very low um, against the risk of them being at home and us not being able to transport them so that has worked really well for us and again some people are still not out but a lot of people are, are really happy to be out and it's just trust with your passengers knowing what they need and knowing that your your um, volunteers are completely happy with what they're doing and anyone who didn't want to volunteer could freely step out and and some of them are not ready yet but we're glad that we have probably about about a third of our volunteers back but listening to both your volunteers and your passengers is crucial and making sure everyone's happy with what they're doing thank you so much that's that's awesome. just such a really helpful opinion i think and and it's yeah. great to hear about your service I, I think the other thing that kept jumping out at me when you're speaking was just the adaptability that your organization has demonstrated you know to move people around and and to offer new things and, and maybe we will see you know do you think you will see a continuation of those more kind of by the phone style services yeah. alongside um you know it's different slightly different here in northern ireland that we've had more restrictions now what we are having to ask people is this an essential journey and that's a difficult question because there was a meeting um yesterday um with nicola mallon there and an essential journey to someone could be um sorry not essential a necessary journey people could deem that getting your hair done is necessary and for people's mental health Yes, that's maybe the only time that they go out in that whole week and have any contact with anyone. Obviously, that's off the table now because our hairdressers, unfortunately, are closed. But we, yes, the phone calls are still continuing. We're still picking up prescriptions. And I put in the chat there, and I just love this story. We had one lady who was shielding. Um, she has a guide dog and she rang and she says, I'm really, you know, my guide dog, I can't walk my guide dog. I'm shielding, I can't go out. And we were able to find another organisation who provided a volunteer guide dog walker for her. And it was something I'd never, ever thought of. Obviously, guide dogs need work. And she was really concerned that her dog wasn't getting out. And if, and someone else was looking for a gardener. So if we can't do it, it's finding who we have within our community that can help there. And I think that's so important that people aren't being left, that something that you maybe don't think is important to you is really important for someone else. And that's where necessary journeys to me could be. If it's a hairdresser, it's fine. If it's the shop, that's fine. As long as we ask the question and they're happy to, to go out, we're happy to, to accommodate them. Thank you for that. And I think, to be honest, it also it really speaks to the relationship you have with your service users that that lady did give you a ring you know and, and share that concern with you because I think you know you're right to say it's, it's more than just the journey isn't it it's all the support that comes along with that and I think that's really you know that's really clear from from that lady's you know just relationship with you and um, I wanted to kind of put that question to to Georgia and Bruce as well you know from a from a non-CT perspective but I'm sure there are questions coming up for you guys as well where you're balancing individuals wants with safety concern is that something that you guys are kind of experiencing at the moment um yes definitely and it's something i think what we've spoken about here of that idea of sort of co-production is definitely the way that we've approached it. it is definitely challenging where we have restrictions in terms of what our legal team our health and safety team are prepared to allow us to roll out and do as the operational staff um, but in terms of we've got several partnerships uh, where we have a sighted guide volunteer that is helping someone get out and about where we had ceased the partnerships we'd reverted all of them to phone contact while we were in strict lockdown and now we're looking to resume some of those and the priorities to resume have been those people where it's it's a case of their mental well-being potentially being at risk from isolation and I think the approach that we've taken most specifically is and it's a little bit arduous but we have over the phone with both the volunteer and the service user 
we've been having a discussion going through the criteria on what for us would be the NHS Scotland advice and just saying if you fall into any of these groups you are considered at a higher risk however these are the measures that we're putting into place by providing um, masks and hand sanitizer and visors to each party and it's really for us it's just a question of has the person been in a position to make an informed decision about what they're entering into and if both the volunteer and the service user in spite of being in those higher risk groups if they are prepared to and if there otherwise would be a risk to mental health and well-being then that's a partnership that we're very very happy to resume that's really helpful thank you i am aware that we have ever so slightly run over um if people i want to head off then thank you very very much for coming um but we can keep going i think for about another 10 minutes there's still a ton coming through in the chat so Gemma, are there any other kind of key questions that we want some insight on um there's very much a, a theme of the conversation around this um question of what is an essential journey what is a necessary journey and i've seen that um we've had debbie thurston angela and vicky all talking about the importance of creating and maintaining different kinds of services that allow CT to um, continue to support people wherever their needs are. Um, and I think that's going to be increasingly important as we go back into tighter restrictions now, as, as we go into different tiers and local lockdowns, national lockdowns, whatever's going to happen next. Um, but there's been a, a question that Bill, actually, our chief exec has posed, uh, which I think would be an interesting one for the panelists to have a think about. Um, let me just bring it back up on my screen. Um, talking about um, the importance of connectivity. So um, interested in hearing what panel and members in the chat think about agencies relying on folks having smartphones or digital technology to access support and keep them connected during the pandemic, especially in rural areas which aren't as well connected digitally or older people who may not have access to the internet on a phone. Is it a problem uh, and what oh. can we do to help? Uh, I think I'll, I'll take that one if you like. Lovely, um, thanks Bruce. As, as well as being a, a guide dog volunteer, I also support people with their mental health um, and wellbeing. Uh, we've seen a raise of 62% of people coming through since the COVID situation. Um, we hold regular Zoom kind of gatherings just where people can have a chat and whatever else. And we've had this issue in relation to connectivity, people maybe not having internet, having the correct smartphones, having the whatever. Um, so what we did was we actually applied for a pot of money um, and we gave people, they maybe had the phone, but they didn't have the, the data packages and things. So what we was doing was, is we, was we was giving them um, data packages, um, the internet dongles, and we was also kind of loaning out iPads and things um, to, people that didn't have connectivity, didn't have the, the techno technology and things. So through the COVID situation, we've been doing that, but we've also been very fortunate in the Murray area um, because there's been local resilience hubs and groups have done a similar thing to what we've done um, at work and they've done the same again. So you've got all these people connecting that never had connection before. Um, but what we've done is we've done our research and we've actually mapped the whole of Murray and we've found out what what internet provider um, kind of hosts the most the, the best coverage in various areas and things. Um, so that that stands us in a very strong position going forward as well. So we can help these people going forward again should we need to. That's such an amazing idea, Bruce. How available was that information to get your hands on? Um, because the organisation I work for is just based in Murray, um, it, we, we have a newsletter and things and then we put it on the social media and things. So, um, But it was through the SCVO funding, through the Scottish Government yeah. voluntary organisation funding that we, we got the, the money to do that. That's really interesting, thank you. And, and actually a really novel way of dealing with that problem because it, you know, it's something that we hear time and time again are those kind of digital black spots. So. That's but what we, what we also had to do, just to finish that bit, is what we also had to do with that was is that for the people that's maybe not had the connectivity or the, the like say, using Zoom for the first time, for instance, we had to do a bit of coaxing, uh, coaching, sorry, not coaxing, we did a bit of coaching over the phone and how to use Zoom and put all the, 
the mix was for. Um, so it's, it's worked really, really good. That's really helpful and, and hopefully not too much coaxing involved in the, in the <laughs> process. Um, Eddie, what, what is your perspective on digital? We spoke about this a wee bit on Monday, you know, that you'd have previously gone and had face-to-face -face meetings with groups of older people. What have you been kind of finding works? Is there a, an alternative? Well, I, I think one of, the, one of the positives of the pandemic is that it forced some older people online at the start of it. So we have heard many stories about people who get, you know, have managed to get an iPad or get tuned into WhatsApp and, and all of that beforehand. And that has ha helped them to connect and communicate with their families and friends. But it's, cl it's clear that there's still a huge amount of older people not online. It's only about 54% um, um, of over 65s are online in Northern Ireland. So there's a huge number of people who are, who are at risk of being more excluded. I think the more we go on in this online world, and I think the digital divide was certainly there beforehand. I think the pandemic has magnified that and the challenges. So it's it's yes, it has its place. And you know, as you know, as I said to you, the thing that's changed the most for me in my job is I would be out two or three times a week speak, uh, speaking to older people's groups. That's obviously all stopped now. So I'm trying to do Zoom calls and Facebook sessions and things like that. Um, it's it's better than nothing, and it's it's good, but it it doesn't it still doesn't replace that face to face contact that you see people have in those social settings. So, um, you know, I think we have to adapt to that. I think we have to continue to try to get as many people, um, online as possible. But even those people who I've spoken to in Zoom, who are the the active people, the people who are always out running groups and organising things, you can tell by them that they're still a bit down in the mouth about, you know, having to just meet their friends and families through the internet, albeit they, they recognize that um, particularly being able to see people is much better than just a phone call for a lot of people. So I think that has made a difference. I mean, the other point I just make, I think this, the issue around essential journeys is, is a really interesting one and a really important one. And I think it's not the same for everybody. And I think there are things that we need to be thinking about. And as you say, Rachel, we have entered a more severe lockdown, uh, you know, from tomorrow, um, we're gonna have many other uh, services closed. I mean, some of some of my uh, colleagues seem more worried about hairdressers closing than, I think they would prefer to have supermarkets closing than hairdressers. It seems they can survive on, on without food more than a haircut. But um, these are, they're genuine things. These are the things that, people you know live for and enjoy and makes them feel good about themselves and i think it's filling those gaps is the big challenge you know if we do face lockdown periods even if it's for three or four weeks at a time those simple those simple pleasures in life that people look forward to that we all look forward to enjoy um we're going to have to try to replace them in some in some way thank you that's yeah i think that's a really good note to kind of pull everything to a close on there. We are going to have to come up with new and, and innovative ideas and looking at the chat, there are tons of them coming up. You know, I, I don't know who first said Christmas cards, but I think that's a, a wonderful idea. And do feel free to send me one because I never get any. Um, <laughs> folks, thank you so much for our panelists, for your input, your perspective. It's been really, really helpful and just eye-opening to, to kind of see how other groups are are tackling these issues thank you for all of you in the chat as well it's been really great to see all these ideas coming and going and um, we will share a video recording if there's anything that you think i'd quite like to get the details of that again and um, thank you to Gemma for fielding all the chat and then um, pulling it all together so beautifully um, and yeah do you please come to the rest of our sessions there's more good to go there's national sessions to meet government ministers or the head of bus um, and of course, there are more policy events. Have a wee look at our website. Thank you again to our speakers um, and go and have a great lunch, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Bye everybody.